Hello. Before we get started with this month's program, we'd like to welcome Jeep and Eagle technicians to Master Tech and take a moment to acquaint you with the materials contained in a Master Tech kit. All of you should be familiar with the reference book. It highlights the information in the videotape and includes photos and illustrations. The quiz on the last page must be completed with a score of 70% or better for Gold Tool Award eligibility. Also included in each release is a Tech News, which contains information on new Chrysler products and programs. The Open End section allows you to submit service and diagnostic questions. Open End Answers are provided by service engineers and are printed in later editions of the Tech News. Another item included in each package is a meeting guide, which gives tips on running the master tech meetings as well as supplying answers to the quiz in the reference book. The last item is available exclusively in this month's Master Tech Kit. This handy DRB2 scan tool booklet lists DRB2 fuel, ignition, charging system, and speed control displays and their meanings. For more information about these materials and the Gold Tool Award Program, check out the brochure included in this month's kit. Now, let's start this month's program. Pollution of the environment comes not only from man-made sources, but surprisingly from natural sources as well, such as volcanoes and decaying vegetation. Much as we might like to, we cannot stop a volcano from erupting. However, there is quite a bit we have done and continue to do about man-made pollutants, such as those that come in the form of auto emissions. Hello. Welcome to this month's Master Tech. In this program, we'll discuss auto emission systems, specifically the various auto emissions, how they're caused and reduced. We'll also discuss the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and the SAE J1930 document and how both will affect you. In addition, we'll talk about the growing use of exhaust gas recirculation and cover a sample diagnosis of an EGR problem. This program will also contain something new to Master Tech, a review question at the end of each section. Well, let's get started with a look at auto emissions. Long before there was concern about the environmental impact of auto emissions, carbon monoxide, or CO, was known to be a harmful gas. Any technician knows the danger of running a car in a closed garage. Carbon monoxide is extremely toxic, and it's for that reason you must make sure auto exhaust is vented out of your service bay or garage. Carbon monoxide is dangerous because it interferes with the blood's ability to transport oxygen, resulting in suffocation. Carbon monoxide results from partially burned fuel, so a rich air-fuel mixture will produce significantly more CO. However, the optimum mixture of 14.7 to 1 will cause low CO. At this point, you may think a very lean air-fuel mixture is the key to lower emissions, but you'd be wrong. Why? Because an overly lean air-fuel mixture will cause a lean misfire, which will increase another emission called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, or HC, are caused by incomplete combustion. Besides being caused by incomplete combustion, HC emissions can also be caused by fuel evaporation and crankcase vapors. All petroleum products are made of hydrocarbons, and when they're not completely burned, they can escape out the exhaust or fuel system into the atmosphere. When in the atmosphere and in the presence of sunlight, HC combines with oxides of nitrogen to produce smog and ozone. We all know that smog is harmful. It can even irritate lungs. But what about ozone? 
You no doubt know that Chrysler Corporation is now using R134A air conditioning refrigerant in more and more vehicles to protect the ozone layer. So why is more ozone bad? Unfortunately, ozone in the stratosphere is different from ozone in the air that we breathe. In the stratosphere, ozone shields the Earth from harmful ultraviolet rays. Down here, though, ozone can irritate the lungs and damage plants. It can even damage rubber products. A rich air-fuel mixture can increase HC emissions as well as CO emissions. As a result, leaning out the air-fuel mixture to the optimum ratio reduces HC and CO by letting the catalytic converter operate efficiently. Computer-controlled engine management makes it possible to maintain an ideal air-fuel ratio. This is important because, as we mentioned, leaning out the mixture too much could cause a lean misfire. Do you remember which emission level this would raise? A lean misfire will raise HC emissions. Computer-controlled engine management is but one system that can help bring both HC and CO emissions under control. The positive crankcase ventilation, or PCV system, is another. Engine blow-by gases that get past the piston rings and make their way into the crankcase also contain HC and CO. The PCV system uses engine vacuum to draw these gases into the intake manifold for reburning. With the engine running, air is drawn from the air cleaner into the engine crankcase. This pulls the blow-by gases that have mixed with this fresh air up past the PCV valve and into the intake manifold. From here, the gases can be burned in the combustion chamber. The PCV valve controls the flow of crankcase air depending on engine conditions. For instance, at idle, the PCV valve restricts the flow. But under high loads, such as during acceleration, the lower intake manifold vacuum causes the spring to open the valve more so a greater amount of crankcase air can flow through it. One method of further reducing the remaining HC and CO emissions after combustion is to use a catalytic converter. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without itself being changed. In the case of a catalytic converter, the substances are usually platinum and palladium for reducing HC and CO, and rhodium for reducing oxides of nitrogen, which we'll discuss later. The catalytic converter heats up to approximately 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. At this extreme heat, when the CO and HC pass over the catalytic substances, they're converted into harmless carbon dioxide and water. Related to the catalytic converter's operation is the air injection system used on the 1993 5.9 liter heavy duty cycle truck engine. This system uses two air pumps to inject fresh air into the exhaust gases at the catalytic converters. This helps burn the HC and CO gases that escaped combustion. The one system that reduces HC emissions but has nothing to do with CO is the evaporation control, or EVAP system. This system stores HC gases in the EVAP canister, also called the charcoal canister. The gases are caused by evaporating fuel from the fuel tank. These vapors are then purged by using engine vacuum to draw air through the canister, carrying the vapors into the intake manifold for burning. If HC and CO were the only two emissions that we had to worry about, they would be taken care of by the systems we just mentioned. Unfortunately, the high combustion temperatures caused by the lean fuel mixtures and high compression ratios that improve fuel economy and reduce CO and HC end up producing more oxides of nitrogen. These combustion chamber temperatures are usually around 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember earlier we said that oxides of nitrogen, or NOx, produce smog when combined with HC. NOx can also contribute to acid rain. Since the obvious solutions to reducing NOx, such as richening the fuel mixture, would increase HC and CO emissions, other solutions must be found. An effective way to reduce NOx is the exhaust gas recirculation, or EGR system. An EGR system routes exhaust gases back into the intake manifold. These exhaust gases reduce the combustion temperature below 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, thereby reducing NOx emissions. 
We'll talk more about the system later. Another way of reducing NOx emissions is through the use of a catalytic converter. Previously, two-way catalytic converters reduced only HC and CO, but three-way converters can reduce NOx as well. A three-way converter with air injection, like the one we mentioned on the 5.9 liter engine, has three chambers. The first chamber contains platinum, palladium, and rhodium, and reduces levels of all three emissions. The second chamber is where the air is injected, so it can flow into the rear chamber. In this rear chamber, air reacts with exhaust gases in the presence of more palladium and platinum to further reduce the HC and CO levels. The last form of auto emissions is perhaps more overlooked than the previous three, unless you happen to be behind a semi that's accelerating under load. Of course, I'm referring to the sooty emission known as particulates. Particulates are particles of carbon soot and fuel additives that come almost exclusively from diesel-powered vehicles. These various forms of auto emissions that we've just discussed have been dramatically reduced from even just a few years ago, and they will be reduced even further. That's what we'll discuss after our first review question. Carbon monoxide is caused by which? Incomplete combustion or high combustion temperature? The answer is incomplete combustion. High combustion temperatures, as you'll recall, cause oxides of nitrogen, not carbon monoxide. As we've mentioned, auto emissions will be reduced even further in the future. This isn't just a possibility either. It's mandated by the California Air Resources Board, as well as by the U.S. government in its Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. For more information on the new emissions standards, check this month's reference book. Car makers aren't the only ones charged with cleaning up the air. Power plants, factories, and many other industries will be affected. But the other industry affected by these changes that you should know about is the petroleum industry. As of November of 92, refiners in the 41 areas of the U.S. with the worst CO pollution had to sell wintertime gas with a higher oxygen content, such as gas mixed with ethanol. To further reduce CO emissions, the refiners in the 11 U.S. cities with the worst pollution will have to sell gasoline with a higher oxygen content year-round by 1995. You may have seen and heard advertisements claiming fuel injector cleaning detergents are already added to gasoline. But did you know that in some cases, only a company's premium gasoline contains detergents? In a service-related regulation, all gasoline must include injector cleaning detergents by 1995. Even diesel fuel will have new regulations. For 1993, all diesel fuel will have a limit on its sulfur content. This will help reduce fine particulates known as PM10. This stands for particulates of 10 microns or less in size. The Clean Air Act amendments contain some items that are even more directly related to auto service. Starting in 95, emission-related components will be warranted for two years or 24,000 miles not the current federal requirement of five years or 50,000 miles, or current California requirements of three years or 50,000 miles. Despite the change in warranty limits, vehicles must now stay up to the new standards for a full 10 years or 100,000 miles, whichever comes first. This will mean that proper vehicle maintenance will be more important than ever. It's important to mention that Chrysler Corporation has always supported clean air and already manufactures some vehicles that meet these stringent standards. To make sure that emission-related components are operating properly, another requirement is onboard diagnostics with an instrument panel cluster light. On Chrysler vehicles, this means the existing onboard diagnostics will be expanded so that the cluster light will be turned on to indicate trouble with the designated emissions components. This new system is known as OBD2, and its diagnostic information will be accessed like fault codes on current vehicles. The format will be very similar to what is now seen when using the DRB2 scan tool, or the MDS, but there will be a little more information. 
A bigger change, however, is that the data link connector will be the same industry-wide. Every car maker will have the same connector in the same place on all their vehicles for emission-related diagnostics by the 1996 model year. The reason for this is that the emission-related diagnostic information will have to be designed so it can be read by aftermarket scan tools, as well as by the specific manufacturer scan tools. Now that we've covered some implications of the Clean Air Act amendments, let's try another review question. Detergents must be added to all grades of unleaded gasoline by what year? 1993 or 1995? The answer is that by 1995, all grades of unleaded must contain injector cleaning detergents. Yeah, so then I replaced the AIS motor and it ran great. No, I don't mean stepper motor, it's called an AIS. Yeah, sure, I'll look it up. I got the service manual right here. Hmm. Service manual calls it an IAC motor. I guess we're both wrong. You know, I don't know why they can't call it the same thing. If you've also wondered this, then you're in luck. Because of the SAE J1930 document, many terms will now be standardized. You've heard us mention this document in the past. Now we'll tell you how all this relates to vehicle emissions. First off, what is it? Well, to answer that, we'll take a look at some of its history. The California Air Resources Board required that for the 1993 model year, all car makers must use the same terminology when referring to emission-related components. The board decided that the 1992 version of the SAE J1930 document would be the standard that car makers would follow. SAE stands for the Society of Automotive Engineers, the group who wrote this document. Since car makers don't want different service publications for just California, these changes will affect all of North America. The SAE J1930 document attempts to standardize automotive terminology. But it's more than just a glossary of accepted terms. The document also tells how new terms are to be created. Let's use the term instrumentation engine coolant temperature sensor as an example of how items are named. The document recommends using a base word and then adding modifiers in front of it to distinguish it. The modifiers precede the base word in order of importance, with the most important closest to the base word. In this case, the sensor senses temperature. The temperature that it senses is the coolant temperature. Its location is in the engine, and its purpose is instrumentation. No doubt you've noticed us using terms in the Master Tech programs that are different than you've been used to. We've been calling what used to be known as the SBEC, the Powertrain Control Module. And we've been calling what used to be known as the Alternator, a generator. These are both J1930 terms. To see how these J1930 terms have affected the DRB2 screens, take a look in the booklet that we mentioned at the beginning of the program. These terms are for 1993 and later. However, as you may have already noted, TSBs written in 92 contain both the old terms and their new J1930 equivalents. Now for another review question. True or false? All automotive system terminology will be affected by the SAE J1930 document. The answer is false. Only those terms that are emission related must conform by 1993 to the terms found in the document. Earlier in the program, we said that exhaust gas recirculation systems can help reduce emissions. Do you remember which emission it reduces? It reduces NOx. It's for this reason that EGR systems have been added to more vehicles for 93. Specifically, EGR has been added to the federal 3-liter equipped vehicles with front-wheel drive and 3.3-liter equipped Caravan Voyager, Dynasty New Yorker, and Fifth Avenue Imperial models. Chrysler uses a system that contains an EGR tube to route the gases from the exhaust manifold to the intake manifold. 
and an EGR solenoid and transducer to control vacuum to the EGR valve. The transducer and solenoid are combined in one unit. The PCM controls the solenoid, which in turn controls the vacuum supply to the transducer. The PCM uses input from various sensors, such as the coolant temperature sensor, to decide whether the solenoid should be open or closed. For instance, if the coolant is at a low temperature, the PCM will not open the solenoid because the engine is not emitting high amounts of NOx. When the solenoid allows vacuum to reach the transducer, the transducer must close a bleed valve based on exhaust back pressure before vacuum can reach the EGR valve. When vacuum is applied to the EGR valve, its diaphragm pulls the valve open, allowing exhaust gases into the intake manifold. These explanations show you how an EGR system works, but not why it reduces NOx. Well, the addition of exhaust gases takes up room that would have held hotter burning air. Less oxygen equals cooler combustion. It's just like turning off the oxygen on an oxyacetylene torch. The flame burns cooler. In the combustion chamber, the lower the temperature, the lower the NOx emissions. Another benefit that may be caused by EGR is an unexpected one, increased fuel economy. Since exhaust is an inert gas, meaning in this case that it takes up space but doesn't burn, it has the effect of making the combustion chamber smaller as if it were in a smaller displacement engine. This shows that emission system components are not necessarily the economy robbing devices that many still believe them to be. Disconnecting them will no longer improve economy but will more than likely reduce it. Let's now take a look at an EGR diagnosis. Since trouble with the EGR system will more than likely appear as a drivability problem, let's look at a sample problem where this happened. A customer came into the dealership complaining of a vehicle that ran rough or stalled when it came to a stop. When the technician received this work order, all he knew was that it was a drivability problem. To confirm the trouble, the technician took the car out on a test drive. In this case, taking the car out on a test drive to verify the problem was the first step of the six-step troubleshooting procedure. Don't forget to use this procedure when diagnosing any automotive systems. While on the test drive to verify the complaint, the technician also tried to find any other symptoms that could be related to the trouble. This is the second step of the procedure. After returning from the test drive, the technician now had information on the problem so that he could move on to the third step of the procedure, analyzing the symptoms. Since the drivability problems could have been just about anything, what manual should the technician use to diagnose the problem? He went to the step-by-step -step instructions of the powertrain diagnostic manual to isolate the trouble, which is step four of the troubleshooting procedure. The first step in the manual is to make sure that the battery is fully charged. It was, so he moved on to the next step, which is to start the car and read any faults with the DRB2 scan tool or with the MDS. In this case, however, there were no faults to read. If this vehicle had been equipped with the onboard diagnostics required for California emissions, then this EGR problem would have shown up as a fault. But since it didn't, our technician followed the procedures in the manual and went to the section for no-fault drivability tests. The first step in this section is to check all TSBs and hotline newsletters that relate to this drivability problem. A quick check proved there were none, so he moved on down to the no-fault quick symptom test to compare the car's symptoms to those in the book. Under the symptom column, there are some symptoms that are close to what the car displayed. Next to the symptoms, the book says to do the no-fault complete test. Under this test, the first individual test is to check secondary ignition and timing. These two items tested out okay. So the technician moved on to check the fuel pressure. As with the last test, he found this to be okay. The next tests are for the coolant sensor calibration radiator fan operation, and the throttle position and MAP sensor calibrations. 
all these tests came out all right. The manual instructs next to test oxygen sensor switching, idle air control motor and solenoid operations, as well as the park neutral switch. Once again, they were all okay. With over half the tests now eliminated, the technician checked the PCM grounds and power circuit. These were fine also. This brought him to the EGR system test. Following the manual procedures, he disconnected the vacuum supply line from the EGR solenoid and connected a vacuum gauge to it. The engine was then started and the vacuum gauge checked to see if it read above 10 inches at idle. It did. What does it mean? Vacuum was getting to the solenoid. Our technician then disconnected the gauge and reconnected the vacuum hose. He next disconnected the solenoid electrical connector. Disconnecting this connector is a step in the 1993-94 powertrain diagnostic manual for the Concorde, Intrepid, and Vision models. Please note that this step was not included in the 93 edition because of a late design change. The 93-94 manual will be in dealerships by late summer of 93. Following the instructions in the book, the technician then disconnected the vacuum hose at the EGR valve and connected the vacuum gauge to it. While watching the gauge, he snapped the throttle wide open. The gauge was supposed to read over five inches if vacuum was getting through the transducer assembly. It did, so this assembly is okay. What should the next test check? The next test checks the EGR valve assembly itself. To perform this procedure, the technician disconnected the hose leading to the EGR valve back pressure signal tube. The ignition must be turned off at this point. He then applied 20 PSI to this hose that leads to the base of the EGR valve. While doing this, the throttle valve had to be opened and closed. According to the manual, this should cause a tone change in the flowing air. Sure enough, there was a change in the tone. This may not be as obvious, but try to guess what this tone change means. It means a leaking EGR valve was the problem. Naturally, the manual recommends replacing the EGR valve, which would be step five of the troubleshooting procedure, repairing the trouble. Replacing the valve is a simple procedure, but make sure that you use new gaskets to prevent any other leakage. Also, keep in mind that each EGR valve and transducer are not only vehicle specific, but depend on the engine and transmission as well. After all this work, you don't want to forget to go to the verification test at the end of the book. This would be the final step of the troubleshooting procedure, verifying proper operation. These verification procedures make sure that everything is operating fine and include such things as taking the vehicle on a road test, and checking for any faults. Now let's take a look at the last review question. When applying 20 PSI to the EGR valve while moving the throttle valve, a tone change occurs if which is faulty? The transducer assembly or the EGR valve? The answer is the EGR valve. The tone change indicated the EGR valve was leaking. Well, that just about does it for this month's Master Tech. We've discussed how the major auto emissions are produced and how they're controlled, as well as informing you on the auto-related issues contained in the Clean Air Act amendments. We've also discussed how the SAE J1930 document will affect you, and we've discussed the operation and diagnosis of the EGR system. As always, remember that service procedures and federal and state regulations change for different vehicles and model years. So always check your service publications for the proper procedures. For more information on drivability diagnosis, why not attend a class at your nearest Chrysler Corporation Training Center? Remember, better trained technicians mean increased satisfaction for your customers and better business for us all. See you next month on MasterTech.